So, good morning. How are y'all doing? Y'all doing good? Okay. Book of James. Let's go ahead and start out in... Um, that's funny. I didn't actually put it on my notes and I didn't bring a Bible with me. James uh, chapter 1, verse 1. Let's just go ahead and read this and get it out in the open there. Do we have it on the screen? Is it in my presentation there? There should be a slide that has James 1.1. 1, 1. No? Now to do that? There we go. Oh, wait, where'd it go? There we go. Okay. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can't even read that. Here, let me read this one. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. And we're going to stop there. Now, whenever I say we're going to preach verse by verse through James, we're not going to do one verse a week. It just so happens that I, got, I, I hit verse one. I said, okay, we have to stop. Verse one is just packed full of information. And any time that you're going to go through a book of the Bible, it's helpful that you understand the scripture you're studying. Right? You realize that the Bible is a collection of 66 books. They are varying types of genres, different types of books that are written. They're written by different people, right? 66 books um, by 39, maybe 40. There's some questions about Hebrews. 39 different authors over a 1,500 year period of time. Okay, there's some going to be some different things in there that understanding about this particular book helps you to bring out. And so knowing uh, the time, the setting, the culture, the author, who they were writing to, why they were writing. Right? Every now and then you'll come across a, a passage where you go, what does that even mean? I don't understand what's going on. But if you understand the setting, the culture, the author, why they're writing, who they're writing to, maybe you can help make some sense of that. And so we always want to try to understand that as we're going into a new piece of scripture. Um, audience. James is being writ written, writ writ James is writing to, easy for me to say, James is writing to Jewish Christians. At this point, when James is writing, um, the, the, the big uh, mission journeys out to the Gentiles had not yet really got underway. And so um, we see he's writing to Jewish Christians who are fleeing Jerusalem. The persecution has started um, among the, the Jews, where the Jews do not like the Christians. They consider it blasphemy, and so they're trying to uh, really put pressure on them. Uh, we see in the book of Acts, this is shortly after Stephen is martyred. Right? Stephen is proclaiming the gospel. The Jews don't like it, and they stone him right there in the street. And it starts this persecution. And so you have Christians fleeing Jerusalem, and that is who James is writing to. Notice it says to the 12 tribes, that's Israel, of the dispersion. They're, they're dispersing. They're, they're getting out of town. And so he's writing to them. And his purpose is to give them a practical application of their faith, but especially in trials. Right? They're fleeing their home. They're undergoing hardship and trials. And so he is writing them saying, hey, here is what your faith ought to look like lived out. Uh, it, real interesting one of the reasons I picked the book of James to go through is because it does get down into the nuts and bolts day-to-day -day life of uh, being a Christian, of following Christ. Um, I've heard people say that James, you know, has a lot of just the practical stuff and not a lot of theology. Well, you can't really have one without the other. My father-in-law years ago gave me a book that's called Practical Theology. It's a systematic book. And it was sitting on my coffee table. And a friend of my wife's was over. And she saw that. And she goes, Practical Theology? Isn't that a contradiction in terms? And she was thinking theology is just this high-minded, philosophical, just abstract concept kind of stuff. And it's not real practical. No, no, no. As uh, A.W. Tozer says, What you believe about God is the most important thing about you. It is going to affect and influence every other aspect of our lives. And so as James, as we walk through James and he is giving us some practical applications of daily life of faith, it is deeply rooted in his theology. And so we see that going on. The date, when was it written? Uh, late 40s? 
I think is about what is estimated because, as I said, he's writing to Jewish Christians. The church hasn't really exploded yet among the Gentiles, which Paul does that. And so right about now, Paul is out doing his missionary journey thing, but the church hasn't really started taking in a lot of Gentiles yet. It's still mostly Jewish. Um, The author. This is the fun part. Who is the author of James? There's four guys in the Bible mentioned who have the name James. Uh, One of them is mentioned in Luke. He is James, the father of Judas, one of the 12. Not not Judas who betrays Jesus. There's another Judas, and his dad's name is James. That's all we know about him. One time he's mentioned, and so probably not that guy. All of the scripture in the New Testament is somehow connected to written by, either written by a disciple, uh, one of the 12, or a disciple of one of the 12. Right, so it's all connected that way, and we really know nothing about that James. Then you have James, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, we know that Alphaeus, uh, if it's the same Alphaeus, is also the mother of Matthew. So this might be a, um, a brother of Matthew. So could be possibly him, but we know nothing else about him. There's nothing about him in any other literature. There's nothing saying that maybe he wrote this. Uh, He's just mentioned that one time in passing in the scripture. Uh, The most popular, most famous James in the Bible is James, the brother of John. Both of them, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee, who uh, they come to Jesus and say, hey, whenever you come into your kingdom, can we sit one on your left and one on your right? And, um, but it's not going to be this James because this James was martyred very early on, very early on, uh, in Acts chapter 12 before the dispersion happened. And so if James is writing to the dispersion, it's helpful if he's alive at that time. And James, the brother of John is not, but there's another James, James, the brother of Jesus. Jesus had brothers. Um, after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary went ahead and um, did the normal family thing. And Jesus has brothers and sisters. Now, here's what we see about James, the brother of Jesus. In the book of Acts, we see that um, he is a leader in the church of Jerusalem. Uh, I don't know if you might say he's the pastor, but he's definitely one of the head elders. Paul refers to him in the book of Galatians. At one point, Paul um, lists, he says, I went and I saw the apostles and James. And so he's linked in there with that head group of the apostles, those in charge of the church. And in Galatians 2.9, Paul refers to him as a pillar of the church in Jerusalem. So James, the brother of Jesus, very uh, powerful, very influential, very uh, leading the church in Jerusalem. But here's an interesting thing to note. I think that that right there, that James, the brother of Jesus, being the prime candidate for the author of the book of James as the leader of the church in Jerusalem, writing to his um, uh, congregants who are, you know, fleeing, he was not always a follower of Christ. I think this is a very powerful testimony if we look at the brother of, James, or the brother of Jesus and kind of his story through scripture. At one point in the, uh, chapter three of Mark, we're told that Jesus' family comes to take him home. He's out there preaching and they think he's nuts. From the things that he's saying and that they're hearing about him, they think he's lost his mind and they come to get him to bring him home because he's embarrassing them. And so James goes to get his brother. Hey, stop claiming you're God. Get home, right? Anyone in here uh, have a brother who if uh, they claim they were God, you'd believe them, right? I'm pretty sure James was the same way. Okay, older brothers run around claiming to be God. Uh, No, let's bring you home before they come carry you away and put you in a rubber room. Then that's what we see of James early on, but then we see him in the upper room with the apostles after Jesus' resurrection. So Jesus crucified, then three days later he rises, he makes some appearances, then he tells the disciples, go and wait until the Holy Spirit comes, and then he ascends. 
And then the apostles and other disciples are all gathered around in the upper room. James is with them in the upper room as they're awaiting Pentecost. But then we see him, as I said, as a leader in the church. And then the historian Josephus writes about James and he tells us that James is martyred for his faith in Christ. We just see in James 1, he refers to himself as a bond servant of Christ. That word in the Greek, uh, doulos, it means slave or servant. It, 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 anyone that would just say, hey, you know, I'm going to go be a slave to my brother. But it's that serious that he is saying that he is a bond servant of his brother. So what happened? What happened to make him go from, hey, Jesus, come home, you sound like a madman, to, yes, my brother is God and I willingly serve him as a slave? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, Paul mentions that the resurrected Christ appeared to James. I'm guessing that if your dead brother came back to you and said, hey, guess what? It's true, I'm God. That you might be willing to believe. And I think that right there is a powerful testimony to who Christ was, to his divinity, the fact that he was the Lord God in the flesh rose from the dead. Because what is going to change the mind of someone who grew up with you, who once thought you were nuts and now thinks you're God? Actually seeing something that proves it to be true. <clears throat> but then we get this word bond servant. The Greek word, like I said, doulos, it means servant or it can mean slave. And that has caused quite a bit of trouble for some people. Uh, there's several verses, especially in the Old Testament, that Christians in the South, back before Civil War days, would point to and say, see, the Bible's telling us right here. It's okay. And I have actually come across this challenge many, many, many times. Uh, there's a, a, a group of guys, um, kind of, you know, outdated now, but referred to as the new atheists following 9-11. They came along and said, look, see, religion is bad. This is what religion gets us, and they're all the same. And so they would point at things, and they would say, see, you want to say the Bible's good, but the Bible condones slavery. Look in the Bible. There's slaves in the Bible. And so I wanted to take some time and address that issue of slavery in the Bible. Does the Bible condone, does it support, does it endorse slavery? No. No, it does not. Not what we would consider as slavery. Does the Bible prohibit slavery? Again, no. There is no command that says do not have slaves. We also have to remember that word does not just mean slave, it also means servant. And if we're looking at this from our 21st century American post-Civil War slavery, Atlantic slave trade mindset, then we're going to horribly misunderstand what's going on in the Bible. In the Bible you have what's called indentured servitude. It is a, I have no money, I am poor, I cannot feed my family, let me work for you. I will be your servant, I will bond myself to you, and you will care for me and mine. And so, uh, you would even have where they kind of parcel out their kids, you know? Here, here, put, put my son to work because I cannot feed him, and he will be bonded to you. It was, it was completely voluntary, there was nothing in that that was as we would look back and think of slavery that we imposed upon Africans in America. The American transatlantic slave trade was completely unbiblical. There is nothing in the Bible that would support what went on in America and in Europe. First off, like I said, it was voluntary. But second... You are not to be harsh. We got a slide up there. We have a verse um, from Leviticus 25, verse 43. It says, you shall not rule over him with rigor, 
but you shall fear your God. And so it's talking about um, when you have a servant, you know, now they're bonded to you. They're yours. They're in your household, their survival, their whole livelihood, everything about them completely dependent on you. And it says, but you will not rule over them with rigor. Instead, you're going to fear God. Because remember, as we talked about, created in the image of God. That person may be your servant. They may be wholly dependent on you to live or not. But they are created in the image of God, the same as you are. Next, um, kidnapping is illegal. It says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall be surely put to death. Exodus 21.16. Kidnapping is illegal. Hey, sailing over to Africa, grabbing people, throwing them on a boat, and holding them against their will and making them work is anti-biblical. So whenever someone wants to say the Bible endorses slavery, well, whatever word you want to define for slave, it's not what we think about as Americans in the West looking back at what happened in our history. Actually, what you see going on is a lot of protections of servants. Most of the laws in the Old Testament that have to do with slavery are for the protection of the servant and for the protection of the rights of the servant. In Israel, they had a rule where you had to let someone go. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh, he shall go free and pay nothing. So you can't take a servant and then just hold on to him and not, never let him go. You cannot keep them against their will. In Israel, seven years, and you had to let him go. Also, you couldn't just turn them out destitute. In Deuteronomy 15, 12, it says, If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years... Then in the seventh year, you shall let them go free from you. And when you send him away from you, you shall not let him go away empty handed. You shall supply him liberally from your flock and from your threshing floor and from your wine press. From what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. And so we don't, you wouldn't just toss them out destitute. There's still this care. There's this, this is a person created in the image of God there to be cared for, not just thrown out and mistreated. Also, in Israel, in uh, Deuteronomy 23, 15 and 16, it says, you shall not give back to his master the slave of one who escaped from his master to you. He may dwell in your midst in the place which he chooses within one of your gates, where it seems best to him. You shall not oppress him. See, especially if you compare the laws of Israel to the law of, say, uh, the Code of Hammurabi in Babylon back then, um, According to other cultures in the area, you had to return a slave. So if you were a slave and you escaped Babylon and you ran over to, um, you know, Egypt, that's a bit of a trek, but, you know, they would give you back. Israel says, no, 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 no. If a foreign slave comes in your land, you do not give them back. Next, it says that you are not allowed to injure a servant that if you actually injure your servant, they are to go free. If a man strikes the eye of his male or female servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. Now, that's not just limited to eyes and teeth. This is giving a, a, a general principle, right? It was common back then, and we may want to go, ooh, that's kind of harsh, but it was common that you discipline someone with you know, corporal punishment. So there would be, you know, a, a whipping or a caning or whatever that might be involved. Okay, we can wrestle with that. But if you were such a harsh master that you went overboard and you caused injury to your servant, they go free. And the rules for setting servants free still apply. You can't just throw them out. You got to give them stuff too. And so um, here we're seeing protection, that's saying, hey, masters, don't mistreat your servants because if you harm them, you have to let them go. Next, killing a slave was a punishable offense. And if a man beats his male or female slave with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. 
And the punishment in the Old Testament for, de- for murder, it was a capital offense. They had the death penalty. And so, um, whereas in other cultures around there, people could mistreat, beat, injure, kill their slaves. And who cares? It's just our property. In Israel, it was no, no, no. That is a creature of God created in his image. It is to be protected. Lastly, subservants would choose to stay with their masters. It says, and if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you in your house since he prospers with you, then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear to the door and he shall be your servant forever. Also to your female servant, you shall do likewise. Notice what it says. So let's say uh, you've, you've had a servant and then you know, seventh year is coming around, time to set him free and they go, I, I don't want to go free. Hey, you know, I'm prospering with you. I like working for you. I want to stay. You know what? I'm going to prosper better with you than I will somewhere else. I want to stay. It's one thing that um, stood out to me as I was kind of looking at different issues of slaves in the Old Testament and ancient culture. Um, Being a a, a slave, a bond servant, um, was a position not... Um, a, a, a place on the social ladder. So slaves would still be educated. They could learn trades. They could learn skills. They would be put in charge of estates. There were all kinds of, they could rise in stature socially. It just so happened that they were bonded to this other person in their work. And if it came about that it was time for you to go free, but you said, no, 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 I want to stay with you because with you I prosper. And so we see James, the brother of Jesus, saying, I am a bond servant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so are we. Him saying that is not just for him. If we are in Christ, then we are bond servants of Christ. Those of us who have said, yes, I could go my own way, but it's with you I'm going to prosper. Lord, it's with you that I'm going to have the good life. It's with you that I'm going to have the joy and the peace that my soul longs for. And so I do not want to be sent away, God. I want to stay bonded with you, your servant for life. That is who we are in Christ. We are indentured servants to Christ. Our sin had racked up such a debt that we could not pay. None of us can. And so what we do is we need a benefactor. We need someone that we could bond ourselves to who could pay our debt for us that we could then serve him. And so Christ came and pay he did. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 19 and 20 say, Do you not know? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And as God's servants, we are no longer identified with the past life that once defined us. That we lived in our sinful desires. Right, Just as if we are, um, you know, a servant would bond themselves to a master, that, that life you had before is gone. Your whole life now is defined by the household of whom to which you're bonded. And we have been bonded with Christ now in the household of God. Sons and daughters of the king. Our whole identity now is found in the Lord. Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He paid that price. He paid our debt. And so we then turn and say, yes, Lord, I will live for you. So what does it look like then to live by faith? Right? Our lives are found in him. It says, the life I now live, I live by faith 
in the Son of God? What does that look like? If this new life that we now have is by faith, how does that work? I'm glad you asked. And James is going to start to unpack that for us in the weeks to come.